Imagine you're about to have your first child, but your career is muddling along and you don't have a dependable source of income. Oh, and it happens to be the beginning of the pandemic where all crypto projects are going gangbusters. Serial entrepreneur Nat Eliason saw a plan to get rich quickly and hatched a plan. Caffeine, Chipotle, and weed were basically the only three things I consumed for two and a half weeks and then like launched this. Then it suddenly had all this money. He taught himself how to program, partnered with some anonymous crypto accounts, and in less than a year, turned $80,000 into $13 million of paper wealth. There was just a random day where I was like, you know, I made 40K today. Like, I'm going to go buy a Rolex. Like everyone, he thought his wealth was going to the moon. In his mind, he'd be worth at least $50 million. But you can guess how it ends. And in Nat's book, Crypto Confidential, he talks about how it all came crashing down. He got hacked. He got stolen from. He couldn't sell his positions. It hurt his marriage. And when the FTX bankruptcy hit, it was basically all gone. But before we jump into this interview, many of us thought that crypto was our way out of a boring job, a dead and career and a way to make a bold pivot. Turned out it wasn't, but if that's you, we have a group coaching program over at radreads.co slash coaching. Now here's my interview with Nat Eliason. Take us through what phase you are in your personal life, in your business life, in your spiritual life, in your financial life that kind of gets the ball going and give us the year. So this was 2020. So at the start of the year, everything was- so start of COVID. Up. Start, well, yeah. So at, in January 2020, like everything was great. And we were just getting this tea cafe ready to open. Agency was going great. Everything was pretty normal. And then COVID hits and we immediately have to shut the cafe down. It's only been open for two months. <laughs> it was brutal timing. You know, we have to shut the cafe down. Cosette was really running that and behind that. So she has to try to figure out a whole new career situation. I was doing a little bit on the cafe and tea business, but I was mostly running my marketing agency. And then when COVID hit, everybody fired their marketing teams and marketing agencies. Uh, and so we lost half of our clients in the span of like three weeks, which was <laughs> terrifying. Right? Wow. And, um, and so we, and we had, you know, everybody was W2'd or a lot of people were W2'd and people had healthcare and mortgages and everything, right? And, and now suddenly the business is unprofitable. And uh, I really, really, really had to just hustle like crazy for the rest of the year to keep the agency alive, to like rebuild the business after that big drop. And thankfully, the market, you know, as everybody knows, kind of started to go crazy towards the end of 2020. And it, it ended up coming together and, and working out. But I had originally been thinking of quitting the agency at the start of 2020. Okay. Because, and, and I had talked to our COO about it and I had said, this is at a good spot where I feel like you could run it. My heart's not in this anymore. I think you'd actually be better for it because you are more long-term committed to it than I am. And we had started a plan before COVID hit. And so that whole plan got thrown out the window and I had to reorient to focusing on keeping that alive and keeping it going. And by the end of the year, it was in a great spot again, great position for her to take over. And I had done this realm course, which had gotten me a, you know, a bit of extra money to like pad me for a while while I tried to figure out what to do career wise. And so I started trying to do like YouTube influencer stuff and decided it wasn't really for me. And then I decided that I was going to learn how to program because I've always actually loved programming. Um, it, it, I have a funny relate or a funny story about discovering that because I took my first programming course in college and hated it, just loathed it and did really poorly in the class. Thought it was the dumbest thing ever. And then I got to my first internship and the company was doing all of this stuff in Excel that were like repeatable things. And there was some of it that you could do with formulas, but not all of it. And so then I ended up teaching myself visual basic and learning how to like write code for all their Excel sheets to like automate some of the work they'd hired me to do. And that's when I said, oh, wow, programming is actually sick. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It means I don't have to do as much work. This is great. But I had never really been in a place to dive into it. And here I was, you know, didn't have a day job anymore, had a little bit of financial cushioning, was able to start exploring it. And then... Can I pause you there? Yeah. So I've known your story for a while. So you've been, you never had a 
traditional like nine to five job or, or rarely, right? I had one job when I graduated from college that lasted about nine months. And okay. even that was at a startup. So it like hardly counts as a real job. You work in these kind of like project based seasons. Like you have a yeah. phase and it could be a multi year phase. What's like, is it like you get a bunch of cash from a project and it goes dry for two, three, four months and then another? Like, is your, has your cash flow for life always been this kind of lumpy uh, project based income? Or yeah. have you kind of found a way to kind of smooth it out? No, it, it's always been extremely lumpy. I'd say that since I graduated college in 2015, so over the last nine years, I've probably made most of my money in that time period within like six or nine months of that time period and not like a contiguous six to nine months, but oh, you know, yeah. there was like you launched the course and then yeah, like a lump so, of money comes in. Right. Like the Rome course, the first, but for the those first, who like, don't know, Rome is a productivity software tool, productivity software, kind of like notion or obsidian and whatnot. It was really, really popular for a period and it's since kind of died off, but I had kind of the first big course on it, which Rome endorsed and they were like telling people to take it because they hadn't built onboarding. And I think that made like 250 grand in the span of a month or a month and a half, which was crazy, right? Because I mean, I had no employees. I had no costs on it. It was just like wild. But then nine months later, it had basically stopped entirely because I wasn't working on it anymore. They weren't pushing it anymore. And people were using it a lot less. They've moved on to other tools. And same thing with when I first got into doing marketing consulting, I had basically made no money from spring 2016 into spring 2017. I'd made very, very little. I was making like $1,000 a month or 1500 a month, something like that. Mostly from the app, actually. Uh, and then I realized people might be interested in marketing consulting. And so I pitched my first few people. And then suddenly I was making... 21k a month or something for three or four months and then it like went to zero for four months again right it's, it's always wow. been this very you know crazy yeah that's a wild um, yeah right that so you've been out of school for nine years and most of your income over so nine times 12 right it's like over 100 over 100 months yeah so 10 percent all of your income is kind of in 10 percent of the months over a that's, decade yeah it should be it's, it's that's probably about right yeah that's wild <laughs> it's interesting it puts you in a very different headspace because most months my like cash position or my net worth or whatever is going down yep right and so like you always spikes hear, and then it goes down and then exactly like it goes it spikes up and then it slowly goes down and it yeah. spikes up again and slowly goes down and there's good and bad to that i think it's good because it your your hedonic adaptation doesn't develop in the same way right like it'd be way worse to have slow growth and then suddenly go to zero and be completely unprepared hello <laughs> <laughs> but like the downside is that i have a a, a sometimes fear-based relationship with money where i'm expecting it to just stop at any moment and so i kind of naturally hoard quite a bit and maybe don't like enjoy things when I can and and all that because I I'm always thinking oh, I'm gonna have to, I might have to live off this for the next two three four years yeah. so I've got to always be in that headspace got it so take us back to 2020 so I guess it's the end of 2020 you learned yeah. to program and you're probably in this in a dry spell of cash right because the the different projects have kind of weaned off yep what's going through your mind at this point well, the, I mean, one was, okay, I've got to pick something I can start to do that has the potential to make money in three to six months. And it, part of why I had that framing was that we, we had savings, but not, you know, an infinite number. And my wife and I were, we were trying to get pregnant, trying to have our first kid. And I knew I needed to have my work stuff figured out before our first kid was born because no idea what the costs are going to look like after that. Um, and she was getting her real estate career off the ground because when the cafe shut down and we sold that off, she decided, you know, she'd wanted to do that since she was a kid and it was a perfect time to go explore it. But, you know, that career takes has a long ramp up too. you usually don't yeah. start and immediately have clients 
it's a long time. So neither of us are really making much money. <laughs> and is the goal to get off this like bursty project based to have like a more sustainable or to just create a bigger pile to, to burn down? Bigger or pile bomb. to burn down. Yeah. Bigger pile to burn down. Not like, yeah, yeah. Get like a salary. I, I was considering getting a salary. I mean, the, the reason I was learning programming was I wanted to be able to like build apps and things that could become sources of income. So maybe something more steady, kind of like a peer levels, you yeah. know, portfolio indie hacker of, type stuff. Yeah, exactly. Indie hacker type things because I knew I could do the marketing, right? I, I was looking at stuff like the Rome course and, you know, it's great to make a bunch of money on a course about somebody else's product, but it's even better if you're the one making money off the product. Yeah. And, you know, I wanted to be able to do that. Um, and so that was kind of where the programming started. And I, and I figured I could get good enough within a few months to be able to at least get some freelance gigs or hack together some apps that could make a bit of money. And, uh, you know, I, I had the confidence there that it would turn into something useful if I really focused on it. So in the beginning, it was 12 plus hour days of just programming education and wow. building things and launching mini apps are you watching courses. youtube videos and taking coding boot camps a mix of things um there's this guy wes boss w-e-s-b-o-s who i mean the the amount of like roi that has come off of him has got to be insane because he creates these incredible programming courses on javascript and react and mobile development and all of these things and they're a hundred bucks for like 30 hours of education it's damn absurd and so i was just mainlining his education material and then building my own stuff along the way and was learning really really quickly it, it was a great way to do it so it was a mix of his material uh reading some like actual javascript textbooks and stuff to like pick up additional syntax and then just building things in the wild you know coming up with little problems i wanted to solve and one thing for our listeners that, you know, when you're on this kind of, you have the pathless t-shirt on, but when you're on this atypical path, you have this lumpy income and this inability to save and to watch your net worth line go up. But you have this like agility to go from one lily pad to another lily pad and just like turn the turbo. It's like, that's almost like the survival instinct, at least I've found as a solopreneur. So totally, it's like not surprising that you can learn coding well and whatever it's three six nine months just by watching hundred dollar youtube video you know uh, yeah courses you can get really far with it um and so that was you know that that was the path that it, it started with and then we're in december 2020 now and i'm starting to hear more crypto stuff on yeah. twitter and from friends and things and if you could remind us like at, at that point like roughly what's the BTC price that it can help like orient people. Yeah, Bitcoin would have just broken through its all time high around then. So I think it's like 20K at that okay. point. And that was, you know, that was so exciting because the, the previous high was like 17K. And so, yeah, as we're coming into December 2020, it's like 20K. Okay. And by the end of December, it's at 30K. And then at the end of January, it's 45K, right? So we're in that period. Where wow. It's just going parabolic. But I had gotten pretty interested in crypto in 2017. I got lightly interested in 2013. I mean, okay, I, I first heard about it back in like 2011, and but like didn't do much with it. Got a little interested in 2013. 2017, I got decently interested and I was buying ICOs on Ethereum during the first like, mania with new silly coins launching and then you know kind of forgot about it and put it in the back of my mind but the one thing i the one thing i did which ended up being you know incredibly smart was i in like 2017 i set up a weekly automatic buy of bitcoin on coinbase where it was like every week a hundred dollars of of bitcoin or something and I literally just forgot that I had that running. It was just coming out of my bank account every week. And, you know, I don't like pour through my statements each month. And it was just coming out every week for those three or four years. And I had a little bit to start with. And then I logged in in December 2020 and looked at my balance. And I had like $80,000 of crypto in there. Wow. 
I was like, on probably what like a couple of grand of deposits, right? If you yeah, yeah, probably like, like less years than of ten grand of deposits plus the bit that I had before, and I'm just thinking like. There's your next spike. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, oh my God, this is a mi- <laughs> it's like, how the hell did this happen? You know, it was money that I had no idea that I had, which sounds absurd, but I had literally just, you know, it, I'd not been looking at it in forever. And so I go in and I look at it and I'm just like, oh my God, like what is going on here? And that's what kind of opened the door to thinking, you know, maybe, maybe programming is too slow. Like maybe I should just go all in on this crypto stuff. And that's where I can really get this next big lump of money. Got it. And are, at that point, are you thinking like, this is how I'm going to make SQ money? Or is this like, I'm going to build a career with longevity in this arena and then make good money? It was in between. I wasn't at that point thinking that I would build a career in crypto. It was much more like, I bet I could make a few hundred grand here. Let's surf the waves. Exactly. Yeah. Surf the wave, you know, get out ahead of a few things, buy the right tokens, something will take off. And that will be what solves the like near to medium term money problem for the next like couple of years while I get whatever else it is off the ground. And is that the kind of ballpark you were looking for? Like a couple hundred grand as a buffer? Yeah. Yeah. I think I was thinking like 300 or 450 at that point because I had been paying myself 150 from the marketing agency. And then I had other bits of income from, I mean, the app, from the courses, from stuff like that. And I was like, okay, if I can get like a few hundred grand, that replaces my agency salary for a few years while I get, you know, I ideally like, you know, I I sort of had always had this goal of coming back to writing and letting writing be the main thing. But, you know, just writing often doesn't (laughs) pay very much. Yes. Yeah. (laughs) 10 words a week is not turning into 80 grand in a year. <laughs> no, no, no. I mean, it's really rare that you can have a mid to high six figure income off of just writing. It's often auxiliary things. Got it. And so you're kind of thinking like if I can get 150 grand a year ish, that's like a solid base. That's the solid sure, base that gives me the freedom to like get Do the writing stuff. career going or whatever yeah. else. Exactly. Got it. So you see these coins go up. Do you, what's the next crypto play that happens? So, I mean, the first thing I did was what everybody else did, which was I I was looking at all this stuff and Dogecoin was having its moment. And so I was on Robinhood on my phone, just day trading Dogecoin. And it, you know, I, that was, it actually went decently well where I bought it when it was start, when there was starting to be like some murmurs of it getting interesting. And then, you know, it like doubled or tripled. And I was thinking like, oh my God, like I'm so smart. <laughs> right. Dude. And the thing that I actually did that was smart was I sold all of my like Peloton and Zoom stock to buy it. Oh, wow. <laughs> so this was like, which was actually perfect timing because yeah. that was, you know, when it was like peak COVID prices starting to go crazy. And I said, okay, like forget trading regular stocks. I'm going to trade crypto and so i sold all of my tech stocks and then i had 10 or 15k in my robin hood account to play with and you know threw a lot of it into doge and some into eth and bitcoin and was like you know trying to ride that up and it you know i i got like a decent little multiple off of it but obviously pretty volatile hard to know when to sell and i came to the conclusion pretty quickly that day trading the majors would never get me where I wanted to get because, you know, obviously if you do crazy stuff with like really, really out of the money call options and whatnot, you can get some interesting results there, but it's, it was pretty obvious that was just gambling. Yeah. And I wanted to figure out a way to try to make a lot of money in the space with much lower downside. And it's easy so you to knew lose. at the time, even though you were in it, you're like, this feels like gambling, but I'm, yeah. I'm winning. Totally. So like, I've got the it, hot hand. So exactly. And I'd always had this, this stance that I don't like putting money into things where there could be very volatile outcomes that I don't have any impact on. Yeah. So like, you know, I, you know, like I mostly buy VT Sachs, right? Total stock market index. Because it's just, it's, it's easy, it's simple, it's, you know, to the degree there's volatility, it's one of the least volatile things you can do in the stock market. 
and like, yeah, I have no impact there, but I don't need to because it's so bigger and liable. Whereas like, you know, buying GameStop options, I have no impact there and it's super volatile, but like working on my own startup, that's super volatile too. But if I work harder, I'll probably have a better outcome. Yep. And so it felt very obvious that if I was going to do something hyper volatile, I needed to try to have some impact on the outcome or at least needed to have a potentially like disproportionate payoff relative yep. to the risk. And so I saw a couple of friends from the like internet marketing world who had gotten super into crypto before me and started reaching out. And they, they were talking about stuff on Twitter that made no sense. Like they were just speaking a completely different language but we're clearly making a lot of money. And so I started DMing them and saying, hey, like, what are you doing? What is going on? Like, what are these words you're using? How do I learn more? And a, a lot of them were really, really generous with like their time and pointing me to resources. And uh, and one in particular who I highlight in the book really helped like bring me into the fold of this like extra crazy behind the scenes world that was going on um, that kind of, served the first part of that need is that the guy who owns the coffee shop no no so the guy who owns the coffee shop johnny was my friend who i was like day trading all this stuff with and he oh, was like it. he was like equally stupid as me right like <laughs> we were we were both doing the day trading stuff and knew there was something here but didn't know how to break into it and then i had this other friend um really really was represented by quinn in the book god and quinn was the one who had been in it for a year and she had told me about it a year ago and I'd been like, that's dumb. That's day trading. Like, I'm not getting involved in that. You're going to lose all of your money. And then I, I come back to ask her about it a year later. She's been doing it this whole time. And I'm looking at some of the trading she's doing. And I'm like, how much fucking money have you made in this time? Like, oh my God. I just, wow. there was, there was one scene that got cut from the book. We're, we're gambling on some new launch or whatever. And I'm feeling really excited that I have, like a hundred like five hundred dollars or something in it and between her and two other friends that she had like joined this group with a year ago the three of them had 150 grand in this thing that they were gambling with and of house like, money yeah at this point wow <laughs> i'm just like <laughs> like what happened this past year like i feel so stupid for not going yeah into this. wow uh, but so was uh, that that was the yield farming stuff like d5 yeah. Got yeah, yeah. So you pivot from day trading to DeFi thanks to Quinn and, and others. Exactly. Yeah, it was because there were all of these new new projects launching, new tokens launching, and they it was really common during that period to launch your token, and then the way you got your token out into people's hands was through like farming by giving them a way to earn your tokens by doing things, which usually meant just putting money into your platform for a time period. And so you could find these new tokens launching. You could, you know, do one of the deposits on their site. You would start getting a stream of their tokens. And then you As could... As interest, basically. Yeah, it's kind of like getting paid yeah. interest in their currency. And then you could, like, redeposit those tokens to earn even more interest. Or you could, you know, go sell them to try to cash out. And it was kind of this, like, game of chicken of how long can we collect tokens and have them go up in value before too many people sell and the value creators... Yeah. And you wow. like miss out, and it was. Can I can was, I pause you there? Yeah, it, yeah, It feels like um, in finance, there's this strategy. You know, um, there there are positive positive carry strategies where you basically make income, but you've sold an option, so you're short an option, so you have like infinite loss potential. And so there's like it's the classic like picking picking up pennies in front of the in front of a freight roll, train, yeah, where yeah. you just like you keep you like as fast as you can, and then boom, the freight train comes, and you just gotta like get off the floor. Yeah. feels akin to that. Oh, totally. I mean, that's really, really what it was because we would, you know, I, I would, and I still see this sometimes, people who farm or gamble really, really well, and you can do it right for a long time and make these 5, 10, 25, 50% returns, and then you suddenly just lose everything. And, you know, one one bad situation where the farm has a bug in it and all the money disappears or somebody tricks you and steals all of it and uh it was you know that but that also made it kind of exciting <laughs> yeah and the aprs on that was i mean you can't even quote it in aprs because it's like you're getting interest on a daily basis right exactly like I mean, you're getting it every you're usually getting it every second and every so second. wow it's constantly 
you know, going. And then the more you claim your rewards and redip- redistribute them, the more you're compounding it. And so you might have, you'd have these farms where it would say, you know, 4,000% APR, but then you calculate the APY on that and it's like, you know, 600,000% or something absurd yeah, yeah. because wow. if you keep, com- you know, just yeah. how quickly you can compound it. And so these numbers got really silly, really fast. To be fair, I got seduced by that too. Um, I took out, so I had a margin line. I, I, I used portfolio margin. And so I, I had margin at like 1.7%. So I was on margin and then depot buying USDC, which is a stable coin. For those who don't know, basically it doesn't lose its principal value. And then I was lending it on BlockFi where I think I was collecting 8%. Maybe. I thought you were doing Gemini Earn. I remember us having no, this I conversation. No, I was Gemini. Oh, okay. Was, I think I was looking into it. Okay, um, okay. But I did it on BlockFi. And I had like it, enough to hurt like yeah. money. And then, <laughs> but yeah, plus it was levered. So um, I managed like, you know, I think the first one, I, I forget which one. Thankfully, BlockFi wasn't the first exchange yeah, to go. Yeah, Celsius or went down first. I Celsius think. went down first, yeah. and then I, I just pulled my money. But if the roles had been reversed, I would have, I would have probably had. I don't know how the depositors got paid, but I would have had like a hundred grand of, yeah. of money in locked lock in the BlockFi estate. I remember having conversations with a few people who were doing similar things back then, where yeah, they were taking out a portfolio line of credit or using a HELOC or something to farm this like 10% return on stable coins with Gemini and, and BlockFi. And it's exactly what I did. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I, I actually feel pretty proud of this that I kept telling people not to do it. Yeah. You because, told me not to do it. Because like those firms, it wasn't clear where the yield was coming from. So it was really risky. Yeah. Whereas with DeFi, you could still get like six or seven percent on USDC, but it was really clear where it was coming from because you could see the the counterparty that was paying more than that to borrow USDC. And so I would do a lot of that. I would be like, oh, I'll put my USDC there to get like six or seven percent because I like know where the risk is. And it was it was cool a year later to see that none of those blew up. Those were all fine. Yeah. Oh, wow. But the BlockFi's and the Gemini's and the Celsius's, yeah. like all of them blew up in some form. Totally. I mean, the people who put their money into Gemini only just got it back this week. Wow. And so it's been locked up for a year and a half. It's amazing they got it back, but like, that's know. still wild. Yeah. But it's crazy because if you actually had like the portfolio line of credit, that was probably yeah. at a margin, uh, a variable a rate. Call. Yeah. 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 Oh, yeah for it's sure. Like, that probably shot up to 6%. So now you're paying it 6% <laughs> on it for a year and a half until you get your money back and you just like erase yep. all of your negative days. carry trade right yep. there. <laughs> and so you're doing the DeFi thing and you're kind of, do you, do you know while it's happening that you're kind of collecting pennies in front of the freight train? No, it felt like free money for a long time. It was really like, it, there, that was the first bit, that was the first time where I was like, oh, we've like really figured this game out. Um, oh, wow. Like this is just free money. This is so easy. This is silly. Like everybody should know about this or not everybody, but enough people like my friends should know about this. <laughs> not everybody because then the game goes away. But it really felt like, cool, this is easy. And yeah. it wasn't until I saw people start to get blown up by it that I realized like just how risky it actually was. Like losing 100% of their principal. Yeah. Is yeah. that yeah, and was yeah, that because of fraud or just it's hard to even... It could be a mix. Sometimes it was fraud. Sometimes it was coding errors. Uh, oh, wow. You know, that I, I tell this story in the book, but at one point, a bunch of people who I was doing this with get blown up by fraud. What was the name of that coin? Uh, the... Uh, Tower I'm not going to spoil it, but oh, the okay. story's in the book. Um, <laughs> get the book. <laughs> yeah, get the book. No, the well, you might be thinking of Iron, which oh, was okay. the... The, the stable coin that kind of foreshadowed all the Luna Terra stuff. But got there it. was a there was a thing before that where a bunch of my friends got blown up. And the only reason I didn't was that I got distracted or something and forgot to finish doing a transaction. I, I had remember like that. I had started doing the thing that would have let them take all of my money. And then I literally think I got a phone call or something must have happened that interrupted me. And then I forgot to finish doing the transaction. And then Everybody got wiped out except for me. And that was just like, okay, this is not a game anymore. Like, I cannot, especially when you've been spending months doing this that I could have been spending on actually learning programming or something else. Got it. Right? Like, it. to spend months making a bunch of money just to lose it all. It's like you've lost all that time, too. Yeah. 
So you basically kind of like me and BlockFi, you kind of call the right time to exit before these these trades all like unwound miserably. No, no, they the, basically you had to. So the the app that ended up stealing everyone's money said that they released this like improvement to their process. Uh, and all you had to do was move your money from the old app to the new app and the new app would be, you know, like, oh, God, the I new got and improved it. one. And I just forgot to move my money. But everybody it, else did. It. And the new one was the trap. Uh, got it. Because they've nice. gotten everybody. Oh, I meant used... more generally, though, in, oh, in DeFi. In DeFi, yeah. Like... I mean, yes and no, because I once I realized it was the pennies in front of the steamroller, I think I just became more aware of the steamroller. <laughs> but I didn't like stop picking up the pennies, <laughs> you know, like, like I yeah. turned to face it instead of facing away from it. Yeah. And so I got a little bit better at the timing when to get out of things. But I mean, not, not as, I mean, it's so hard to actually become good at knowing when to get out. Um, but I, I did shift focus from just doing the DeFi gambling to, well, really the way you make money here is by working on a project because, if you work on something, then you just get tokens for the project and then you can just sell those tokens and then you're not putting your own money into gamble with, you're just getting money, right? Got it. But you're getting- A little you bit know, like equity in a project, right? Exactly. Like, yeah, like yeah, yeah. It's like getting equity in a startup, except that it is immediately liquid and tradable and highly speculative and part of all this mania. So then at that point- um, have you have you made good money? Are you like inching towards your 150 goal? Yeah, the so you know at that point I've made like gosh, how much did I make? Yeah, you know, at at the peak there I was so I was up to like 60 or 70k that I had made, and then I lost most of it when I got hacked. Boom. Um, that story's in the book. I lost like 30, so I got mo slightly more than half of it. You know, I lost like 35 grand. And then basically when that happened, so I was, I was knocked down to like 25 K or 20 K. I took the rest of what was in my coin base that I had said I wasn't going to touch. So, uh -oh. and like put that on the table. Wow. Cause I was like, classic okay. gambler's move. <laughs> yeah. Classic gambler's move. You know, that was the, this is just the safe, boring Bitcoin that I'm not going to touch. I'm not going to gamble with it. I'm going to, you know, just use my winnings for that, that, that ADK that you had found. Yeah. Or it yeah. Was which at that, that point, which at that oh, point that. now was up to like 120K or something. Got right? it. So it was just like solid extra chunk of money to play with. Yeah. And, but yeah, I had told myself I'm not going to touch that because I don't want to lose it. But then after, you know, seeing a bunch of other people get blown up and then me getting hacked. And then kind of deciding like, okay, I think I understand how to be safe in this arena now. And I like won't make those mistakes again. I pulled almost all of that money on chain and started gambling with that too. Got it. Got it. So yeah. that leads to, to, to the next kind of the major project, right? Or, right. Or right. eventually it finds. So what, tell us what this project is, how it found you, who the participants were. So, I mean, this idea is a great idea and it's going to happen. Somebody's going to do it do it really well, which is, I mean, a lot of people are going to do it really well, which is, you know, gaming with crypto elements integrated into it. And I've always been really bullish on this idea. And it always seemed so obvious because when I was playing a lot of these video games growing up, like World of Warcraft and Dota, and now, you know, with Fortnite and things, people spend an absurd amount of money on yeah. in-game items. Roblox. Yeah, Roblox, right? Like people will spend tons on purely cosmetic items, like things just to look cool and different, which is really no I different than my buying ten year old on this. Yeah, I'm sure, right? Like it's a status signal, it's a, you know, tribe single. It's the same same thing that we do in real life with expensive bags and shoes and like stickers on our laptop, right? Like it makes sense that there would be a digital version of this. And games have had gray markets for this for years, but if, you know, if somebody, if, there will definitely be games that have crypto rails so that you can sell the items in the game for USDC or ETH or whatever else. And so you can use those assets to buy things in the games too, because it's a much cleaner system than having to actually set up like a, you know, a, an actual like Visa and MasterCard and like yeah. bank transfer thing. Plus, if you have one gamer tag, 
you know, like natalison.eth, I could show my assets from every game in one place. They'd all be connected to that singular, like on-chain identity. And, you know, as somebody who spent a lot of money on this stuff and has done a lot of this stuff, like that would just be a no-brainer to participate in, right? Like it's, it's, it's going to happen. And that's going to be what really opens up a lot of these game economies into like actual real mini economies, which people spend so much time and money in games anyway, that it's natural for them to have mini economies of their own. And so what these guys are trying to do was a, an on-chain like Diablo style roguelike game. So okay. you have a character, you level him up, he learns skills, you get gear, you know, swords and armor and everything, and you fight progressively more challenging dungeons. And depending on how challenging of a dungeon you're fighting in, the rewards and the loot and everything is better and better. And all of those assets can be sold for cryptocurrency. So you, you know, you'd buy your character and a lower level character would be cheaper than a higher level one. You'd level him up and like get items. And then you could sell those items for the in-game currency gold, which you could then convert straight to USDC back and forth based off like the current demand for in-game gold. Um, and yeah, I mean, it's just like, you know, it, it, imagine a, a game like that, but where the in-game currency turns into USDC almost instantly, right? Like, and is this a game like World of Warcraft type? I'm yeah. not a gamer type, but yeah, yeah. yeah. So you're Final Fantasy. You have like, you have some skills that grow and you, you exactly, okay. you get more powerful and you can play with, with friends and stuff like that. And, you know, the, and the, the idea was fantastic. And I've been looking for a project that was doing it and, what what had happened was I had, you know, so I had my friend that I mentioned, Johnny, who we had both started off day trading Doge, and then he got super into NFTs, got like crazy, crazy, crazy into NFTs. And I said, like, hey, have you seen anybody doing really cool games in crypto? And he said, you know, he told me to look at Axie, and Axie Infinity, I think, is the one that most people heard of. I've actually where, heard of that one. Yeah, yeah, where you you had these little monsters, and they battled in 3v3 formations but if we're being honest it was a pretty shit game <laughs> like there was it was it was super basic super limited nobody was really playing it to play it they were playing it because playing the game was how you got their currency and you needed their currency to breed your axes and breeding your axes is how you got new axes and you might get rare ones which you could sell for thousands of dollars because everybody wanted to speculate on axie what was the like peak market cap of all the oh, Axie God. currency billions or hundreds I think it was of billions? like 20 billion 20 billion yeah I remember it I mean it was like front page WSJ that's how mainstream this game or this yeah. idea got Axie got so crazy what was their let me just look really quickly I'm really curious yeah so their all-time high price was 164 dollars times 270 million tokens Jesus 44 billion yeah 44 billion okay so they had created like a World of Warcraft currency of worth $44 billion. It's like bigger yeah. than like every rental car company in America, like combined. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah, uh, absurd. Um, wow. So you get pitched to do this game with some art. So Axie was out there and I was looking at it, but it felt like it was already just way too popular. And I was looking for something really early, right? Like something where I could get in that people didn't know about yet, but that had potential to become the next axi right because the thing with crypto is everybody's always looking for the next x yeah they see bitcoin take off and they say okay what's going to be the next bitcoin what's going to be the next one to go like that they see ethereum they're like what's going to be the next ethereum like chain to take off i'm going to go bet on that one they see you know crypto punks and bored apes taking off for nfts they say what's the next nft it's going to take off like that's where most of the gambling in the space comes from is there'll be a big run up in the main thing and then there'll be all these follow-up run-ups in derivative things. And over time, the, the derivatives get worse and worse and worse and lower effort and lower effort and shittier and shittier until the whole thing just like collapses. And, it, you know, Axie was the only game that was really taking off. And so it felt obvious that there would be a bunch of other games that would follow it once people felt like Axie had kind of lost the initial steam. They'd look for the next thing to gamble on. So the smart move was to join something that could be the next thing to gamble on. And Johnny had found this other game that I call CryptoCraft in the book that hadn't launched yet, was just getting started, was just selling their first characters. 
And he was like, you should check this out because I've been hearing about it on some of my NFT podcasts. I've been seeing some chatter on Twitter. And I, I joined the Discord and saw they were hiring a Solidity engineer, the, a programmer for writing Ethereum and crypto code, and ended up doing their token contracts and everything for them and helping them launch their token and helping them like build crypto into their game and, and doing all of that. And that was sort of like the big team that I ended up working with. So can I pause you there? So yeah. this was the programming language you had learned, Solidity. So like not a, exactly. Or, I'd been learning JavaScript okay. and JavaScript and Solidity are very similar. So it was pretty easy for me to hop over and start learning Solidity once I realized I wanted to learn crypto programming. And the, the reason I made that decision was I was joining these discords for all of these like crypto projects and crypto startups, and they were all trying to hire Solidity engineers and they were offering 250K plus tokens for a Solidity dev. And back then, there were fewer than 10,000 active Solidity devs on GitHub. There was like one shitty Udemy course on how to do it. There was nothing on learning how to write so you were smart early contracts. to that language too. Really early. Yeah, yeah. Got it. Why wouldn't someone like a, like a Facebook engineer be like, oh, I, you know, someone who's been coding for 20 years and like, oh, there's this thing around the corner. Like, why don't like, why don't I just learn that? Like, why were there? Was it because it was like these new coins? They're just like so under the radar, like no one would even know about it. Yeah, it was so under the radar. It wasn't obvious from the outside that there was this huge demand. You know, there, there's obviously a lot of risk, right? You might not make any money. The tokens might not be worth anything. And when I was starting to look for those roles, that was just starting. Okay. So by the by the end of the year, you did have a lot of people doing that. By the end of 2021, you had a lot of people like leaving their meta job to learn Solidity and like join okay. a crypto startup. Got it. Because Once they realized... license there early. <laughs> <laughs> they, they realized what I eventually realized, which was that most stuff was actually very easy. Like it wasn't crazy complicated programming. It was complicated if you were doing like a brand new type of application, like really French stuff. Yeah. But a lot of it was kind of reusable. You could look at what other people had written and just had to know how to implement it. And that wasn't crazy complicated. And this is what blows my mind because like you talk about how you go in and you basically launch like the coin and the the rules and the ice the offering or whatever. Yeah, yeah. And I'm like, I know you're a smart guy, but you've only been coding for like, I don't know, nine months or, t or 12 yeah, months. Yeah, three or six months at this point. Yeah. And these are, you know, you're taking in, I mean, we could talk about the number where this thing gets to, but like it turns into like this like multi hundreds of millions of uh, project. And like, I get it, like, I'm not doubting you, but I'm like, aren't there people that have been doing this longer than you? <laughs> than yeah. you? Like, like when the numbers get so big, like at well, risk, it, it, it's like, it was like crazy to read that. Yeah. And it, that was actually kind of a common story because when, when they hired me to do it, they didn't really have any money. And so they couldn't, or they didn't have much money. So they couldn't go hire a really expensive, really senior person. They couldn't hire an agency or whatnot to come in and do it professionally. They needed somebody like kind of cheap and new to it. And I was just excited to like get my feet wet on a project. And so I did it for cheap, you know, just for tokens. And I mean, when I did it in my head, it was literally like, this probably isn't going to go anywhere. Like, this isn't going to be worth anything, but it'll give me an item on my resume so I can get a job at, like, another project and, like, yeah. build up my Solidity career that way. Um, because, yeah, I mean, I, I wrote all of those all those contracts and most of that code within, like, two and a half weeks. And somebody with, like, basically no experience. And then eventually it had over $100 million in it. And wow. it was like, that's... <laughs> <laughs> You know, imagine like, because that's that's more money than like a, most regional banks probably yeah. have, right? <laughs> and like those have, you know, people with certifications yeah, and totally. like, you know, user expertise, like managing like money cyber and whatnot. Security. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I mean, I was literally like strung out on caffeine and wow. like, you know, just caffeine, Chipotle and weed were basically the <laughs> only three things I consumed for two and a half weeks and then like launched this. Wow. And then it suddenly had all this money. I like, I, I did not think it was going to go anywhere. I really thought that it like, maybe it would make me like a hundred grand or something. God. Um, maybe, maybe they would have like a little bit of a surge, but then it just went ballistic later.
Got it. So this game goes ballistic off the heels of the Axie game success, presumably, yeah. or that's one of the... So my theory ended up being correct, which was Axie, you know, it, it had this big run up. And let me just look at their chart quickly to confirm I have the dates right in my head here. They had this big run up. And then, yeah, it starts declining in November. And of 21. 21. Yeah. And so as it's declining, people start thinking, okay, what's the next gaming thing? They didn't. And there was one other big game called DeFi Kingdom that was like basically just trying to do what Axie did. And they had like a little bit more of a game, a little bit different style, but it was really like breeding. Like breeding was the thing. You you buy the NFTs, you turn them into more NFTs, you sell them to the next person who wants to, you know, try to infinitely increase their number of NFTs. And eventually the whole thing collapses. Um, and so DeFi Kingdom was the next one to take off. And so as Axie's coming down, DeFi Kingdom just like like starts to go ballistic at the beginning of December. And then they hit their peak and they start coming down. And that was when people started being like, well, what's the next DeFi kingdom, right? And then they started looking at us. They started saying like, oh, this CryptoCraft game, like that's, like maybe we should go over there and look at that. And that's when the token went from like, you know, $1.50 or $2 in like December 20th to $13 by January wow. 6th. So we just God. had this like, absurd run up over the next two and a half weeks as everybody tried to jump into like the next wow. next thing and you're getting paid in no cash just in tokens yeah so this was this was where things got kind of interesting is you know when when i started talking to them and they said you know hey do you want to work on this i said yeah and they're like okay how do you want to get paid and i said you know just pay me two eth a week until this is done and launched and that was a lot of money. I was asking for like six grand a week. Six grand a week, yeah. Yeah, yep. it was about six grand a week back then. But three hundred K annually. But I knew that's what a Solidity engineer was worth. All right. Yep. Like and they they clearly didn't have anybody else if they were talking to me. And I was like, well, you know, I, I want to get paid something because I don't you know, like I don't think this game is gonna go anywhere really. Like maybe it'll go a little bit, but and they basically just wouldn't pay me anything. <laughs> so oh, again, wow. I think they didn't have the money. And after pushing them a little bit, I was just kind of like, okay, you know what? Whatever. Just pay me tokens. Like, fine. Like, yeah. I'll just take tokens. And you're like, this is going to be a learning experience for me. Yeah, this will be a learning experience. This is just a way to get my feet wet. And so I say like, okay, you know what? Just give me 1% of the token supply. Like, you're going to launch with 100 million tokens at one cent each. So, you know, you were valuing the game at a million dollars. Give me 1% of that. So give me 1 million tokens, which is about $10,000. Okay. That's the math in your head. Like I'm That's doing this for 10 head. grand. Yeah. And then the founder actually comes back and says, are you sure you don't want 2%? Because you've like done a lot of work here. I want to make sure you're fairly compensated, you know, whatnot. And I'm, I'm like, well, yeah, actually that would be sick. But it like, just the way these token launches worked, asking for more than 1% was like unusual. Like you usually didn't pay somebody, who, you know, if I did recurring work, there would be more tokens and stuff. But if someone was just doing a token launch, like 1% was already kind of an aggressive ask. And so I said, like, I appreciate that, but no, like, give me some of the game gold. Um, that's not going to be worth as much as the actual token, but like, then I can play the game more and whatnot. Like, I'll take some of that. And so he's like, cool, locked in at 1%. And, you know, the way it works in crypto is that you can actually make these smart contracts, this code that holds money and releases it. And so I made a, a smart contract that would hold my 1 million tokens and then would release them every second. And so I could go to that contract anytime, hit claim, and it would give me however many tokens I had earned since the last time I claimed. Okay. Basically like like a withdrawal from your, you know, imaginary bank account, so to speak. Exactly. Or like you yeah, like, yeah. got it. And this was all but, vested coins? Well, they were vesting over a year. Oh, okay. Got it. So the agreement was you'll get 10% up front, so a hundred thousand tokens, and you'll get the other 90% vested linearly over a year. Okay. So got it. every so it'd be like every day you get twenty seven hundred tokens. So you could just go in, hit claim. I'd get that day's tokens, and I could just do that however often I wanted. And then you could convert them to USD if you wanted to. Yeah, I could sell them. I could redeposit them in the farm to earn more. I could, yeah. you know, kind of do whatever I wanted with them. So just some math here. So if you could pull out twenty seven hundred tokens a day, and that you you made a passing comment that it hit thirteen bucks. So that's yeah. what, you know, 2,700, right? So that's like 40, 35 grand a day yeah, so you were making. It, it ended up actually being more tokens per day than that because 
I, I then negotiated to do additional work. I, I negotiated an extra 300,000 tokens as like a monthly retainer to keep doing work for them. Got it. And then I had deposited a lot of my tokens back into the farm originally so I could increase my number of tokens. And so, so this I was, was like yielding them basically. Yeah, exactly. Like, like, yeah. So I was Got getting it. like 4,000, almost 4,000 tokens a day, like 3,800 wow. or something. So the, at the peak of the market, I was pulling out about 50 grand a day. 50 grand a day. And were you yeah. actually converting it to fiat, US dollar? No. Yeah. <laughs> For those of you listening no. uh, and can't see Nat's face, there is a shitting, eating, eating, eating grin, no face. Yeah, no, so, no. I mean, because... So fast forward this to yeah. like, so this game blows up, like on the, uh, positively blows up. Yeah. Like at, at, at its peak, what's your, what's your stake in it worth? Yeah, the, the most that I ever had in it on paper was about thirteen million dollars. Thirteen million bucks. Yeah. Wow. So that and was between that was between yeah. the tokens I still had and hadn't sold and the tokens that were remaining to be unlocked over the rest of the year. Got it. Yeah. But like a startup, right? That you could have, you know, two percent of Facebook shares, but if Facebook is private and there's no secondary market great you like you can't yeah, you can't yeah. eat the 13 million like you exactly. just gotta watch it Un yep. although unlike facebook which is a private print that gets revalued you know every time they raise money uh here you're seeing the revaluation every second yeah like 24 yeah. 7 365 yeah i mean uh, during that period i would see my like crypto net worth move by like high six figure low seven figure amounts on like a daily basis holy crap yeah, it was pretty so, crazy. So 13, and like, how are you, how are you feeling the day when you're like, I'm worth $10 million on paper? I, honestly, I'm thinking that this is going to $100 and I'm going to be worth 50 or 60 million. So like, wow. this is just the start. So yeah. the whole thing, like, like, it's just hard to, well, I don't know what bias that is, but yeah. you know, it's just, that you know, it's it, like true. You just like, oh, it's, it's just going up more. Yeah, I mean, the, the only way you're crazy enough to get to that point is if you're crazy enough to imagine it's going to keep going up, right? Yeah, and, uh, and, and it's like it's on steroids for crypto, right? Yeah, because like, it's so you fast. Took so much. Yeah. And you know what? What I was thinking was, it was like, okay, Axie went up to forty billion. DeFi Kingdom, forty billion, went, okay, forty billion. Yeah, like Axie or you know, DeFi Kingdom went up to, it was like ten or twelve billion, right? Got it. So I'm like, okay, we could go to like 6 billion or 7 billion and, you know, we're at 1 billion now. So that's another like 6X. 6X six on the yeah, 13, like, yeah. You know, maybe we'll only 2 or 3X. So I really shouldn't be selling most of my stuff here. I should still be holding on to it, right? It's like that. that's what's going through my head as we're passing $10 is like, this is probably going to go to like 50 or 60 or like it could, Yeah. you know? Wow. Um, and so the day it's worth like 13 if you were to sell what was liquid with it, how much of that 13 could you have actually hit the market with? I think like, so of what was liquid and unlocked, I think I could have taken out like 1.2. Okay. So, it. you know, it, most of it, no. Um, it was unvested and locked. Or yeah, liquid, some of it yeah. was unvested, some of it was locked in the farms, but... Yeah, it, it would have been somewhere around like one to one point five that I could have like dumped on that day. Yeah. Um, but then you get into this other problem in crypto, which is like liquidity. Yeah. Because the liquidity to trade within, you know, I, I think at that point there was like fifty million dollars of liquidity on the token. Okay. So it was it that much? I think it was that much. So you you trading a million in 50 million of liquidity, like would have had a pretty noticeable hit. Yeah. And, you know, unclear how much that would have like dropped it. And so this was actually a problem from the moment my token started unlocking was that I couldn't really sell everything because if I did, it would have too big of an the impact market. in the market. Exactly. Even like selling, let's say in that $1 million example, you could sell like even selling like 25 grand would have moved the market. 25 grand wouldn't have moved it that noticeably. And I know that because I checked after I sold like 30 or 40 K that day. Okay. But once you got into the like 50 to 75 K range, you could, you could see the, on the like 10, 15 minute chart. And the, the concern was that since crypto, 
is so transparent, everybody can see every single transaction that happens. Oh, and you were and the pseudo insider, which we won't exactly. don't need to get into here. Yeah. And, and I, you know, again, I didn't really think this was going to turn into anything. So I had all the yeah. tokens go to the wallet that had my name on it. Oh, uh, yeah. So then people could see like, oh, natalison.eth just dumped $50,000 worth of tokens. And yeah. then people would like get angry at me. So there was that oh. whole side of it to balance too. So how does like one, so you're playing for like 150K when you get out, you know, when you start this adventure. At one point, your paper net worth is 13 million, but you don't, you, you know, that it's not really, yeah, like it's not transactable 13 million, but you also think that it can hit 50 or 60 or 80. Like, how do you, how does like, I think like somewhere in that phase, you like buy it. Like, how do you decide what house to buy when you're like 150K to not, you know, 13 yeah. million with the upside of 60? Like, how does that in, like impact your like your psyche on your own, like what Man. you actually are worth. It, it, was, it was, yeah, it was really bad. And we had to, I, I ended up having to cut some of this from the book because it just like got too obnoxious. But, you know, we, because then I bought a new house in the fall before any of this took off. Like I had just started working, I was making a bit from it. I was making like 500 or a thousand dollars a day, which is still a lot of money, but like, you know, a more reasonable amount. Um, <laughs> I know that doesn't sound that reasonable, but compared to where it goes, you and know, compared to the risk you were taking. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And so we had bought like, you know, a, a great house, but a more modest one in August. And then now this happens in December, January, and we're like right back on Zillow. And we're wow. just like, well, forget this house. Like we could buy a $2 million, $3 million house now as this keeps going, you know, like we should just ball out and get something awesome. Right. Like this isn't slowing down anytime soon. Yeah. Um, and so like, you know, there's that going on. It, it was, it was so much coming in. Did you end in. up doing it? Um, getting well, the new okay, house? so actually this is kind of a funny story. We ended up, we decided to be a little more conservative and like still get a bigger one, but not like go completely crazy with it. Yeah. And we put in an offer in February of 22 and the builder said it would be done in April. And then we get to April, May, June. It's not done. It's not done. It's not done. The market's going down on houses. And we actually backed out of that because they wouldn't renegotiate with us because we had put in an offer at like one, two, five. And mm-hmm. now, now the market was saying it was probably worth like one, one or one Oh five. And they wouldn't renegotiate. And we're like, all right, like we're not buying this house. You said it would be done. It's not done. Right. Like we're canceling. And they, it, it eventually sold for like nine eighty seven. Oh, wow. Um, so there's like all these, awesome, you live in all, there's all these yeah. bubbles like, like happening and collapsing and like, yeah. kind of, I mean, they're all types of Fed policy. Right? Totally. Well, and, <laughs> and Cosette was working in real estate, you know, and she, you know, so she was, and she ended up doing an absurd number of deals that year. I mean, she did like 13, no, 17 million in volume. I mean, some, they have crazy amount of transactions. And so it's like for both of us, it's just blowing up like crazy. And yeah, I mean, it was literally like I would roll over out of bed in the morning and hit like one button on my laptop and I would have another 20, 30, 40 K in my crypto wallet from whatever had vested overnight. And I mean, yeah, like I left a lot of that in their token and like I converted a lot of it to ETH, which then went down 80 percent and I wasn't pulling a lot of it out, but I my lifestyle was changing. And so like. You know, there was just a random day where I was like, you know, I made 40K today. Like, I'm going to go buy a Rolex. Like, I want a Rolex. Like, I'm just going to go buy one. What's a Rolex? Like, 10 grand? Uh, I I mean, the one that I got was like 16, 17. Yeah. And, you know, which is like, it's a lot of fucking money to spend on a watch. But it didn't feel like anything because it was like, I made that while I was sleeping. Right. Like, who cares? Um, Yeah. Okay. One very funny thing on the Rolex is. As, as I realized like how stupid I had gotten and as the market was crashing and all this stuff, I was like, why the fuck did I buy that watch? Like that was so dumb. But eight months later, the Rolex actually held its value way better than anything else in crypto. crypto. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it was actually like a smart diversification strategy. <laughs> yeah. Because you don't strike me. You're not for the five, seven years I've known you. Like you, you don't, you're not a flashy. I mean, you like to travel well and do well and yeah. like drink good wine and stuff but like besides that you've never struck me as like someone that, that 
spends money on things. I yeah, I got there real quick. Let me tell you, <laughs> like, <laughs> you know, we're just have like, the Rolex. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 That's uh, it's it's a, it's a good story. You know, I want to keep. Yeah, it. it's a nice keepsake from that era. Totally. Um, and it's a beautiful watch. Like, I I do yeah. love that watch. But oh, yeah, man. I mean, it's just like it it got its hooks in so quickly, and like we'd be bored on a Saturday afternoon, just be like, oh, you want to like go to the Gucci store and spend a few grand and like cool. that just became a normal thing right and like I don't feel good saying that but yeah. it's true and in some ways now I actually really see it as a blessing because like I had that experience early it happened really quickly I you know got to feel it and I got to feel how it feels when it goes away and to realize that that stuff actually didn't really like provide any value or whatnot in my life and like when it's like the money is going to come back at some point in my life and when it does i'm not going to want those things like i'm not yeah. going to care about them you tasted it and I you tasted, tasted it, it probably in like a, a pretty narrow window of life yeah that, yeah, yeah that's yeah. fascinating so t tell us how, how did it how did the shit hit the fan i mean obviously we knew we know what happened to crypto prices yeah but... i mean yeah you know 13 was the peak and it just fell from there and it it it, it it kind of hovered between five and eight dollars for a while. And then it eventually sort of hit this point in May around, you know, it was in the five to eight range for a while. And then it was down to like four and three. And, you know, for a while it was like, oh, well, this thing will happen and then it'll come back. Like this will happen and they'll come back. Like, oh, gaming is going to have another wave. You know, it's going to come back. Everybody was like, we just got to be patient. And it's going to, it's going to come back. And, you know, thankfully I was still selling some every day because it was the only way to get some of my tokens out given the the limited liquidity and you know it it never came back and then when when the big crash happened with terra luna and celsius and three arrows and all of them in may then it really started to drop and now it's at like two cents oh wow that's great and so as it's going from 13 to 8 are you like trying to sell as much as you can or are you still kind of like playing this it's going to come back you, you know, at that point, it's not going to 60. Yeah. Well, no, I don't because I'm like, oh, oh this don't. is a correction. You know, it's Ooh. like, oh, yeah, it had this crazy spike and now it's going to correct to consolidate at this price and then it'll like go up again. Right. I mean, that was just yeah. sort of, you know, you, you see plenty of examples of that. And so you assume that, oh, this was just like the baby peak and there's going to be a big peak. You never know when it's yeah. the big peak. Oh, right? yeah, that's right. We, can, always... we have the benefit of hindsight sitting here today. But... Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And so, you know. I, I'm I'm still selling like fifty or sixty percent of what I'm getting each day, but I'm reinvesting or holding on to the rest of it. You're selling today at two cents, or no, 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 not oh, today. I don't, oh, have, I don't really okay. have any left. I'm saying back then. Yeah, got it, got it. So when it like when it was all said and done, like do you have a sense of what you kind of took home? I mean, your peak was thirteen million. What you kind of took home, you know, we'll add the the, the Rolex to the calculation. <laughs> yeah. The, <laughs> the, the relics of the Gucci bag to the calculation. Exactly. <laughs> I mean, it's tricky to calculate because yeah. most of it was getting converted to other crypto. Mm -hmm. um, and then a lot of it got like gambled away on other things. Right. But like the amount that I actually pulled out was somewhere around like 1.2 to 1.4. Oh, um, but, you know, then a lot of that went into other things that then went down 60, 80%. Mm -hmm. right? <laughs> like, yeah. Yeah. So, and, you know, some of it, is like now coming back or right? like the ETH is coming back. Yeah. But like I bought a CryptoPunk and, you know, I paid 300 some grand for that. And now it's worth like a hundred grand. And so, you know, is that going to be worth more again? Or is that just going to keep bleeding out forever? Right. Like, you know, it's, it's, it's hard to say. Was there a moment when you're like, I'm just, whatever I have, I'll just leave there. we like, I'm done with crypto. Like I'm done. Like with the doing mental, stuff. In it. Yeah. Yeah. Doing stuff in it. Yeah, I mean, really, sometime in, or... sometime in late 2022 was really when I was just like, I can't be in this headspace anymore. You know, a after, after the Luna crash and a lot of money left crypto and people just weren't launching things as quickly, it wasn't as active, there was just less to do. And, you know, I, I didn't really want to work on the game stuff anymore. They didn't really need me anymore because we weren't doing token stuff because nobody cared about the token. Um, and they were just going to go work on building the game to make the game really good for when the next cycle came and so between all of that i was like yeah i don't really want to be active in this space anymore and then i was working on the book and i wanted the book to be the main focus and really try to get the writing going and thankfully i 
I did take enough out and, you know, have enough left that I could just focus on writing for the three, four, five, six years, however long um, yeah. the, the savings would last. And uh, so I, I got that part of the goal, thankfully. Yeah. So, so, so mission accomplished. Um, probably, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Do you look back on, so 20, say, let's say you get out in 2022 and you're starting this in like early 2020. So, God, it's only really just two years. Mm -hmm. It feels like a lifetime. Just even reading yeah. the book, I'm like, it feels like a decade of life lived. Almost all of the book happens between, I mean, really the book happens between like April and January, like April to April. It's like one year is like the, the thick of it. Wild. So looking back on the experience, what would you say were the things that you will kind of savor most? Mm -hmm. And what are the like, fuck, I'm so glad I don't have to ever deal, deal with that again. Yeah, I mean, the as stressful as it is, being in that kind of manic, hardworking headspace is kind of fun, right? Yeah. Like, you know, waking up every day and like shipping code and, you know, seeing the token go up and seeing people like use the app and find it and talk about it on Twitter and like building a bit of a Twitter celebrity in crypto during that period. And like, like that was cool. And the amount that happened in that year, you know, where it's like, April, I'm thinking, you know, like April, May, I'm thinking like I should learn how to program crypto apps and like try to figure this out. And then by December, the token is hitting a fully diluted value of like a billion dollars, right? It's like, that's absurd. Yeah. That that time frame for all of this stuff to happen, I'll probably never yeah. have something quite like that in the rest of my life. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. So like it, that part is super cool. But just, you know, all of the stress that came with it, you know, really, really, I think, make it something I wouldn't want to do again. You know, there's once the once the token and stuff was launched, I then knew that if I had screwed up in any way, everyone could lose their money. Right. Yeah. So yeah. I'm like going to bed every night worried that I'm going to wake up and find out we've been hacked or something awful has happened. Yeah. And Dude, the anxiety and you like, yeah. we didn't even talk about this. You had a young child in this, like, in, like <laughs> yeah. half of this process. Yeah. Or... Yeah. So we're like, we're in the newborn phase. Like our daughter is two months old, oh, God. like when it's getting to be the worst. So I'm like not sleeping very well. And, and then, you know, there's like, you know, there's tens of millions of dollars, over a hundred million at some points in here that like could get hacked and taken away at any time. More and more people are getting angry at me for selling some of my tokens. And so I'm having to like deal with that constantly, which is like this whole other frustration. And that was such like a, a shitty situation too, because it's like, well, I can't not sell this. Like yeah. I can't just leave all of this on the table because like <laughs> that you know that would just be so stupid yeah, but if yeah. i if i sell any meaningful amount people are going to be like angry and like yelling at me and all this shit because like they just want the token to go up they don't want anyone to sell like all this stuff and so that was just a nightmare yeah. and yeah i think just like seeing how quickly the money like changed who i was was bad uh mm. but useful right yeah you know, yeah. and, I, and I think, too, it was like, oh, OK, I actually succeeded. I made a lot of money really quickly. It didn't make me happy. It, you know, kind of made me somebody who I didn't like very much. And so instead of just trying to build a bigger pile so that I can go do writing later, I should probably just do the writing because that other plan is 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 not the way. I mean, there, there was a point in april of 22 where i was pretty seriously considering joining a crypto vc firm and like going all in on this career and then kind of had this wake up moment where i realized that if i didn't quit the build a bigger pile process now to actually do the writing i might never do it all right like there it, it could be a decade before i came back to it so i started talking to agents instead Beautiful. It's, it's so funny. It's like you basically led the exam in life through this like this like hyper capitalistic game. Like you saw like the whole story condense in eleven months. I speed ran a finance career. <laughs> totally. <'Cause... laughs> totally. I love it, man. Oh, Nat, um, this has been amazing. I loved the book. I was like, Thanks. as I'm reading, I'm like, I'm so fucking glad that I was I had nothing. I was getting anxiety reading your story. <laughs> yeah. 
and it was like Saturday afternoon. And I was like sipping a cocktail while while I'm reading it. So um, tell us. I mean, obviously, we'll link to to all of your your um, places and, and destinations in the notes and description. But where can people go learn about the book, Crypto Confidential, you, your writing, and all your other neat projects? Yeah. So Crypto Confidential, you can find on Amazon, Audible, everywhere. Just type that in, search for it. Um, should be at like most large bookstores too. So if you prefer that, find it there. Um, in terms of my other stuff, blog.nataliason.com is where I do most of my writing now or, you know, like essay length pieces and things like that. And then uh, Twitter for everything else, just at Nataliason there. That's usually where I'm most active. I have an Instagram too, but I, I'm, I'm not on there nearly as much, even though it's got a decent following now. So awesome, man. On that always a pleasure to hang and uh like i said proud proud to call you a friend i learned a ton from you and thanks for sharing your story man thanks so much for having me on love to talk about it